Bona tarda a tothom. Bona tarda a tothom. Good afternoon, everyone. I think some of us are watching from abroad, so we'll have the session in English. Welcome to the School of Public Administration of Catalonia. You know, it's the second oldest school in Europe, founded in 1912. So that makes more than 100 years that we've been here. We are going through a thorough project and deep uh, process of transformation. We don't want to be a teaching school anymore, or not only a teaching school anymore. We want to be a platform for thought, for a change of knowledge, not only having this sort of, of events, but really trying to leverage all the knowledge that is scattered around all public administrations that people that know so much and how we can help them in reflecting about what's going on and how administration has to be transformed in the future. This is what actually is bringing us together today, the debate around everything related to how knowledge is transferred to reality, how the psyche or the thought is transformed into public action or public decisions. We thought that we had everything well sorted, that we knew how the brain worked, that we were rational people, that we knew how to plan things, and we just found out that it's not exactly that way that depending on how we plan things, that how we talk to each other, things happen sometimes very differently than we thought. Uh, we think that public administration should be having at least two kinds of reflections around nudging and the science of knowledge or the science of decision making. One is how do we have to transform the administration concerning or regarding to the new development of science. It's not, as I said before, it's not a straightforward how we have to transform the administration to provide a, a reaction and to be able to provide public services according to what science is telling us. And the other one, which this is a more personal point of view, is uh, how should the common good or the public uh, common good um, lead this kind of transformation? Uh, I made the statement, I think that the, the public thing should be leading the way or the paths towards science is leading us, not only in, in, in nudging or this kind of science, but also, for instance, in, in artificial intelligence, etc. If we let only some specific point of view, and this can be the private sector or the technological sector, if there is only one view in things that are affecting the, the way that we make decisions together, the biases will be thorough, they will be huge, and will be most likely harming some collectives. So I am quite convinced that all of us, and this means the state as a representative of most of us, uh, should be having a leading role in the paths and the kind of research that has to be done, and especially how this research and the new knowledge is transferred to the reality through innovation. So I think that today's session is very interesting and in these two ways, how the advancement of science affects a public administration and the, the common good and public uh, decision making and how the common good and public decision making should be leading or at least have a say on the development of these new endeavors that science is putting us uh, before us. Enough for me, I will lead, uh, I will let uh, Julie Ponte, who's chairing the session and organize all thing, and he's the author or the coordinator of the book to, to, let, to speak and, and to lead us through this afternoon. Julie, please, thank you. Thank you, uh, Ismael. Thank you, Mr. Peña López. Thank you, Director. It's a pleasure to be, to be here today and to participate in this activity in the Public Administ Administration School of uh, Catalonia. And in my case, as you know, the pleasure is even bigger uh, in my condition of a former director of this institution. So thank you very much for your hospitality, and thank you for, for the session. Well, according to the program, the idea is that uh, four authors uh, participating in the book will intervene, beginning with some uh, words uh, from Professor Cass Sunstein, one of the authors uh, who has a chapter with some um, preliminary considerations. Um, Professor Sunstein, due to 
professional, uh, I mean, commitment, uh, is not here and uh, he is not uh, online, but he uh, recorded a video, a uh, short video with some uh, words and ideas about the book, and we, we are going to begin with Professor Sandstein's uh, word. I think that the video is ready. And uh, I know that there are many people online from all around Europe and other countries, so uh, we should be sure that we can share the video with the people. Yeah, I don't know what. Okay, perfect. Uh, it's a great honor to be with you in this way. I wish I were with you in person, but in this way is a good alternative. Uh, it's a great honor. And I'm um, honored to speak a bit about nudging and person, choice architecture. And I'm going to give some examples and then and, say a little um, bit about the basic about ideas. So there are three applications of the idea in the United States. A number of years ago, we had a problem with poor children who were eligible for free school. Meals, States, a number uh, of breakfast ago, and lunch, we but they weren't signing up. So the question was, what was the best approach meals, to help these children uh, have uh, the, the meals to which they had a legal right? So the question was, uh, was the, the intervention was to say that the children are automatically uh, eligible for free school right? meals. Uh, the they don't have to fill out any forms. They don't have to sign up. They are automatically eligible. As a result of that nudge, at last count, over 10 million children were enjoying free. As a result of that nudge, there's a problem faced in Switzerland where the government has been keenly interested in the problem of climate change and reducing greenhouse gas emissions. And what the uh, response in Switzerland, Switzerland was, was a nudge. Basically, people were enrolled in solar and wind energy, green energy, clean energy sources. And if they wanted to opt out to have a dirtier and less expensive source of energy, Energy, energy they sources. could. That was the and policy. But large companies, small companies, households, energy, and medium sized companies overwhelmingly stayed in to the clean source of energy. And as a result, in Switzerland, the uh, reduction in greenhouse gas emissions has been and as substantial. a result in Switzerland, Here's a third the, problem. Uh, in many nations, in people have problems with debt including credit card debt, and often that problem is faced particularly by people who don't have a lot of money, which means the problem of debt is a serious problem, not a minor problem. Some nations have responded with a nudge, telling people either by text message or on their credit card bills of the consequence if they don't pay on time or if they go over their bills. The result of that nudge, which is the nature of a reminder or, or information disclosure has been to save people money that they really nature of need. A reminder From these examples, I hope it's clear that a nudge is an intervention really that preserves freedom of choice, that helps people get to the destination that they want to arrive at. It might be a better economic situation. It may be better health. It might be more years on the planet. It might be something involving education or employment. A nudge is like a GPS device. It's something that allows people to choose the destination, but that helps them get there. And if people don't like the route suggested by the nudge, they don't have to take it. It preserves freedom. We can think of nudges as falling into two categories. Many of them are educated. This might involve, as in the case of credit cards, just information disclosure. It might be a warning. It might be a reminder by text message or online. Often, educative nudges have very powerful effects. Improving outcomes for vulnerable people. Often the second kind of nudge is architectural. Architectural nudges basically make one outcome the default. It's what happens if people don't change it, as in the case of children being automatically eligible for free school meals, or people being automatically enrolled in solar energy. That is architectural. It might be an architectural intervention that places certain products in a very visible location, perhaps online, perhaps in the store, perhaps on a government website. 
visible if things are very visible and salient, people are more likely to choose them. Perhaps but they don't the have website. to. It's only enough. If things are very visible it might be and people salient, are simply people asked are what they to want choose to choose. But they don't have Sometimes to. people end enough. up in a bad situation be because they never make a choice at all. A nudge can simply say, what would you like? This outcome or that outcome? That often can influence people to make a choice that makes their lives go better. We know from data in many nations that architectural nudges often have a very large impact, as do educative nudges. People often like educative nudges a little bit better in surveys, but they switch to like architecture nudges better if they learn that architectural nudges have a more substantial effect in improving people's lives. We've seen at the United Nations, in Germany, in North America, in France, in Italy, Italy, in We've Asia, in, nations, uh, in Germany, most of the nations North of the world, America, that France, nudges are Italy, often very impactful Asia, in, in making uh, people's lives better, most of the even the though world, they do not impose coercion and they do not impose economic costs. Lives better, so the signal effect of nudges is like a GPS, do they don't impose a cost. They aren't a tax, they aren't a fine, they aren't a subsidy, but they often institute significant change. That's why they are often very cost-effective, because the economic burden for the government or for people who are subject to the nudge is often exactly zero. We know that that helps explain why in combating the pandemic, nudges have been part of the repertoire of governments, and why this is broadening to health and safety in general. I have just one final thought for you, which is that one of the best kinds of nudge is taking away administrative thought, burdens which or is obstacles, of the sometimes called sludge. We want more nudge and less sludge. Burdens sludge is often having an especially large impact on people who are elderly, people who are sick, people who are poor, and people who have a poor education. If we take away administrative burdens and barriers, we can often have a very large impact on outcomes. That's my last thought for you, but I have a last plea for you. And that comes from the answer to a single question, which is why in but this I year, 2022, and, and we think is the most precious thing that human beings are blessed with. What is the number one we think thing we are lucky to have? What's the most precious thing of all? Uh, in 2018, 2017, 2016, there would have been a lot of reasonable answers. In 2022, I think one answer stands above the rest. And it is a four-letter word, and the word is time. Let's find, shall we, ways to give more people more of that. Let's find, shall we, Thank you for your work. Thank you for listening, and a standing ovation for me to you. Thank you for your work. Thank you for listening, and a standing ovation for me to you. Okay, so I think that, uh, thank you to Professor Sunstein for recording the video. I think that uh, with uh, those first words, we have a vague, a general idea about something called nudging. Um, some of you probably is the first time you encounter this concept, other uh, know it perfectly. So uh, let me, as a first speaker today here, uh, to cover three aspects uh, in my introduction before giving the floor to my colleagues and co-authors in our collective uh, book. Um, first, before presenting the contents of the books, I uh, would like to explain how uh, it originated, I mean the origins of the book. Why this book that we are uh, in, in presenting today. Second, I would like to introduce uh, several general points about some of the main ideas uh, included in the book. And uh, third, 
uh, I will give you an idea of the different chapters uh, that the book contains uh, in a very uh, brief uh, way. The first, um, the first idea, the first uh, idea I would like to share with you is about the origins of the book. Um, there is. Uh, there is still relatively little research and uh, few publications about behavioral insights from a legal point of view in relation to law. Um, in my opinion, this is surprising, uh, taking into account that the premise uh, that law is a behavioral system at the end of the day, due to the fact that law seeks to shape human behavior. Uh, to behave in certain ways and not in others. It is even more difficult to find works including a transdisciplinary perspective with contributions both from the academy and the professional world. Uh, in this regard, in, in the field of uh, behavioral law, uh, for instance, there is a, a need, a clear need, uh, to incorporate a significant role for transdisciplinarity in order to solve complex problems, uh, which therefore requires a degree of uh, humility, in some sense, from scholars to facilitate, to make possible a fruitful dialogue with different subject areas and professionals. Uh, precisely, we were talking about that before starting the session with Professor Polanco, uh, the difficulties of transdisciplinarity uh, and the, well, the, the, the barriers that uh, we find when we try to develop this approach. But with growing force, uh, authoritative voices such as the League of European Research Universities uh, and other institutions are emphasizing the importance of interdisciplinary research and teaching to unleash the potential of university sector and social innovation. Uh, in the belief that uh, such a transdisciplinary approach uh, could play a key role, we, uh, a group of uh, academics and professionals, created a thematic a thematic transdisciplinary research network, network with the title Nudging Applied to the Improvement of Regulation. Uh, this uh, research network won a call for grants in 2018, and uh, a year later, in 2019, we began to work together. 19 people from six different universities and two public institutions, um, between them the School of uh, Public Administration of Catalonia, uh, with varied professional profiles, including law, economics, psychology, political science, uh, linguistics, and sociology, uh, have been working with international partners on the topic of law, behavioral insights and uh, with the goal, with the idea of uh, improving government and public administration. Over the course of uh, this year, since, 19, uh, since, since, sorry, since 2019, with various difficulties, it's not an easy job, and with different degrees of success, we have tried. We have tried to create a common language one of the uh, greatest challenges uh, faced by academics who uh, try to work by means of an approach which has tried to combine perspective, insights, thoughts, uh, knowledge from different fields. Uh, since 2019, we have uh, published several analyses related to the aforementioned subjects. 
uh, behavior, behavioral law, uh, nudges. I, I will come back about nudges uh, immediately. Uh, and uh, we have uh, maintained a website and a blog which are still uh, active. And in that website and in that blog, you can find different works, articles, analysis, etc. One of the results of the uh, transdisciplinary network created in 2019, and the reason for our meeting today, is the collective book with the title Nudging Contributions to Good Governance and Good Administration, Legal Nudges in Public and Private Sectors. It has been recently published by the European Public Law Organization. If we focus now on, on the book, um, let's move now to give you some um, main ideas uh, included in the book. Uh, the book considers the relationship between law, including various branches of law, uh, that is uh, constitutional law, <coughs> administrative law, tax law, uh, in combination with other sciences, economics, linguistics, and political science especially, and uh, taking into account behavioral insights in order, in order to do what? In order to make uh, effective uh, the relevant right to good administration included in Article 41 of the European Charter of Fundamental Rights as well as in other international instruments and national case law. In my opinion, this is another reason for the relevance of the book that we are presenting today, Beyond Transdisciplinarity, the link between behavioral insights and the right to good administration. Uh, probably some of you are um, familiarized with the, the right in, in other cases, you don't know anything about the right. Let me just uh, uh, tell you that the European, uh, the European Union Court of Justice has a consistent case law which has established that the diligent and impartial public activity is associated with the right to good administration, uh, which is, and I'm quoting the European Court of Justice, one of the general principles that are observed in a state governed by the rule of law and are common to the constitutional traditions of the member states. That is, the European Court of Justice uh, case law has insisted that there is a legal obligation to develop public functions with diligence, due diligence or due care in order to fulfill the duties connected with the right to good administration. You can see in the slide the wording of the right. Um, making this right uh, real, effective, uh, means that first, elected officials and civil servants must avoid taking into account irrelevant elements when deciding, including <coughs> cognitive biases an important concept that I will consider immediately. On the other hand, uh, second, due diligence and due care imply taking into account how citizens decide and how regulation should be designed to be effective and change their behavior. This is a, a, an European concept, uh, but uh, Although other legal systems, like for example the uh, US law, don't use the words good administration, its spirit can be found in them too. For example, in the American case, we can find uh, the idea of good administration in the judicial approach known as the hard look uh, doctrine, also known in the US as recent decision-making, a widely employed standard that shows how the emphasis has shifted from reviewing arbitrariness 
towards a judicial scrutinizing of the quality of the agency's reasoning. In that context, in that international context, uh, not just in the European uh, arena, but beyond that, the book we are considering analyzes how knowledge about cognitive biases and nudges can improve the functioning of public administrations in an effective and inexpensive way, preventing corruption, I will insist about that later, bad regulation and maladministration. Therefore, before all, all I, I think it's relevant to consider the important concepts of biases and nudging briefly. It's true that Professor Sunstein has introduced some ideas, but I would like to say something more and uh, use some other examples. According to contributions that, uh, from what are known as the behavioral sciences, uh, a group of sciences including especially psychology, together with the well-known works of uh, Daniel Kahneman, uh, the 2002 Nobel Prize winner in economics, it's now widely accepted uh, that, first, The absolute rationality of human beings, the homo economicus, doesn't exist since it's limited, it is limited, and furthermore, it doesn't take, take into account uh, perfectly rational behaviors like, uh, for example, reciprocity and altruism. Uh, beyond that, sciences show us that uh, uh, human rationality is interfered with by heuristics, another important concept, that is mental shortcuts to save energy. And uh, this rationality is not only interfered with by heuristics, but uh, by biases too. Uh, the biases are systematic and foreseeable cognitive errors caused by heuristics, which work associated with what is now the system one of our mind, the automatic and intuitive, as opposed to the more rational and slower uh, system two. In this slide, you can uh, check some examples of biases uh, which affect human beings in general and public managers uh, in particular. So we have the bias of inertia or status quo, uh, which has a relationship with the idea of aversion to, to change. The bias, for example, of availability, uh, which has to do with the relevance that we give to the information that is surrounding us, or the uh, bias of representativeness, or the uh, bias of optimism and overconfidence, uh, which, explain, which explains, by the way, that some public works, uh, I mean, are delayed uh, and uh, uh, imply the investment of, of much more money that we thought at the beginning, because public managers were uh, optimistic, too optimistic. Those are human biases, but I have chosen them because I think that uh, are good examples of biases affecting especially public managers and the development of public functions. Because of them, because of uh, biases, um, it's not unusual for our brain to deceive us. Scientific progress uh, show us that people, that we, we are not perfect decision makers who maximize our interests with absolute rationality. On the contrary, uh, people's deviation from rationality are already well studied. It is from these scientific contributions that the notion of nudging arises. From a purely linguistic perspective, uh, and 
with different words in different languages. Nudging means gently pushing or tapping on the ribs to warn, uh, remind, or gently admonish uh, another. Okay? That's the movement. But there is a more specific meaning. In the seminal work on the subject, Richard Thaler, the Nobel Prize winner in 2017, and Professor Cass Sunstein, uh, created a definition of uh, nudging in the field of uh, public policy, well, in an, from a general perspective, but especially useful, I think, in the field of public policy. And you have the <coughs> definition in the slide. Okay. As you can see, while I'm speaking, the idea is that nudging as an activity uh, using uh, nudges uh, is configured as a an, uh, as an, uh, way of uh, changing the decision making with an uh, incentivizing impact on individuals, but not based on economic incentive. We know that very well as a, as a way of public intervention, uh, the idea of carrots, the idea of uh, investing money for promoting some uh, uh, behaviors. Uh, no, no, no. In the case of uh, Natchez, there is no money, or almost no money. The idea is that the incentive is based on the knowledge of heuristics the shortcuts and biases, the systematic errors. And uh, using nudges, we promote certain decisions among citizens with the idea of uh, promoting uh, personal well-being and, above all, general interest, which is the uh, public administration goal. Examples of nudges uh, in different areas uh, are easy to find. Uh, Professor Sandstein has used some examples. I'm going to use some others with images. I think that it's easier if we uh, see some uh, uh, images about that. For example, uh, I don't know if the ladies are aware uh, of that, but uh, in, uh, in uh, gentlemen toilets, especially in airports and in other uh, areas, uh, it's famous the fly. The fly tried to promoting uh, that people use properly the toilet and avoiding, uh, I mean, uh, public investment in cleaning uh, toilets. This is just an example. Okay? There are many other examples in the area of uh, traffic, in the area of waste management, for example. In many other areas, for example, I think that Professor Sunstein has mentioned uh, this in the area of uh, private pension plans to increase personal saving using nudges based on uh, default uh, options uh, in order to counteract the bias of inertia or status quo, organ donation, energy consumption, tax collection, Professor Rothas We'll explain something more about that. And even green nudges to protect the environment and to fight against climate change. There are many others, including nudges uh, that can be used to promote public integrity, as the OECD has underlined. Uh, I think that uh, promoting integrity and fighting against uh, corruption is an interesting field which has the name of behavioral ethics, a specific area of the behavioral insights. Uh, there are a lot of nudges, but if we, if we try to give some structure, some order to the multiple cases of nudges, which we try in our book, uh, first I think we can distinguish between private and public nudges. That is, nudges used by the public sector and nudges used by private actors, companies, uh, and, the, and the market. Uh, if we focus on uh, public nudges, nudges used by the public sector, we can classify them according to this distinction. And at least we can identify three different types of uh, nudges. First, the first uh, 
type of Natchez are fixing, or the activity of fixing options set by default in regulations that affect citizens' decisions. In this way, some of the aforementioned biases are counteracted. Uh, especially the bias, which I have mentioned before, the bias of inertia or status quo. Mm -hmm. A good example uh, of that kind of nudge can be found in, uh, in the Spanish legal system. Mm -hmm. uh, Article 5 of uh, Spanish Act, Act number 30 of 1979, uh, on organ extraction and transplantation, which, by the way, is a public service considered to be one of the best in the world, establishes, the Act establishes that, in principle, by default, everybody in Spain is donor unless there is an express proof of their opposition. The same bias uh, of a status quo or inertia, that is aversion to change, can be found in other areas of human activities. And uh, natches to fight against that bias can be used to encourage the subscription of private pension plans, as Professor um, Sandstein mentioned. And in countries like uh, the United States or the UK, they have developed specific public policies like the SMART program in the US and the NEST, N-E-S-T, in the United Kingdom to promote uh, private um, savings. Second classification of uh, Natchez that we use in our book is um, um, the establishment of an obligation for private parties to provide information to prevent them from using consumer biases. That is, the idea of imposing uh, information, uh, obligations of information uh, on um, private companies. For example, regarding the impact or the activity on the environment, or as in the case of uh, automobile manufacturers, or on health in the case of uh, food staffs, like in the example. Finally, a third uh, example of the category of nudges uh, is the use of the provision of information by the administration to influence the behavior of citizens and orient them uh, towards purposes of general interest, taking advantage of biases, such, for example, following the herd, that is, our tendency to do what the other people do. For example, information on the degree of tax compliance, probably we will know more uh, later, or information about energy consumption in our neighborhood or other behaviors on the part of fellow citizens can have an influence and can, and can change behaviors. <coughs> well, uh, nudging, that is the uh, design of Natchez and the implementation of Natchez has inspired the specific public regulatory policies in different countries around the world. I, I cannot stop here. Uh, we consider several examples in the book. Uh, for example, uh, former U.S. President Obama devoted attention to these policies during his, terms, his term on, of office with two executive orders that you have in the slide issued uh, in relation to nudging. Even uh, President Biden is following the same path now with a, a recent uh, memorandum about the use of uh, behavioral uh, uh, insights in uh, his administration. Actually, nudging has uh, given rise to around 200 specific organizational structures to promote its use around the world, none of them in Catalonia or Spain. The well-known, uh, or the, probably the most well-known case, is the British Behavioral Insights Team, 
with more than 10 years of work in the area. And uh, Natchez has been the subject of many reports, you have some examples in the slide, issued by the European Union and international organizations such as the OECD and others. Using those concepts, the, concepts, the concept of uh, bias and the concept of uh, nudges, nudging, the book, I would like to, to focus on a specific question. The book, lit, uh, uh, or the book analyzes how nudges could lead to a better regulation of the private sector in several fields, uh, improving compliance through less intrusive public intervention that respects the relevant legal principle of proportionality. Let me say something about proportionality because we insist on that in the book and I think it's an important point. Uh, this is an important question. Uh, I mean, how to reduce authoritarianism in public law by considering the legal principle of proportionality and the use of nudges. As is known, according to the principle of proportionality, widely used, especially in European law, any public decision in any area must respect three legal filters. First, the public decision must seek a general interest, suitability. Second, or third, depending on the order, it doesn't matter now, the benefits of the public decision must outweigh the costs of this decision. This is called proportionality stricto sensu. And uh, the third filter is the necessity test. And uh, in our opinion, it's crucial. To pass the third filter when seeking the general interest, it's necessary for the public decision to choose the alternative that affects citizens' rights as little as possible. In other words, the least burdensome option. And this is a legal requirement connected to the principle of proportionality. It means that uh, public decisions, pu public uh, uh, decision makers must consider uh, various alternatives since they must weigh the relevant elements of, of them for making uh, the final decision as required by the idea of good administration. That's the point, our point, the point in the book is the following. If nudges are less invasive of citizens' original freedom than regulatory limitations or prohibitions, that is the command and control, the traditional command and control way, and nudges are at least as effective as limitations or prohibitions, then the principle of proportionality will impose the use of nudges. To sum up, the, the book underlined the idea that authorities are obliged to nudge in some circumstances. And I think that it's important because it's precisely here that there is a bridging concept uh, that of effectiveness of the alternative, including Natchez. And uh, this bridging concept connects law to other science, like sociology, political science, economics, etc. Because how could an, administra an administrative decision maker know the effectiveness of one alternative or another alternative uh, to be adopted, if not on the basis of the available evidence provided by these sciences. Uh, I think this is a point to consider uh, because I think it's important. It's uh, necessary to take into account that the mainstream law in general and in other, probably my colleagues will talk about uh, <coughs> the same from other perspectives, uh, the mainstream uh, law in general, including administrative law and tax law uh, as branches of law with a close connection uh, with good administration, um, has not been very sensitive to these developments. We can say that at the moment they are not uh, mainstream, not yet at least, at, uh, and especially in some countries. 
For example, if we, if we take the case of uh, administrative law, which is considered by professors Velasco and Moreu chapters in the book, um, both from a teaching and substantive perspectives, we will see that uh, uh, administrative law, the, the regular, the standard administrative law, is far away from those uh, points of view. Regarding tax law, uh, we will have with us Professor Rozas and he will give us some uh, ideas about that. I'm going to finish uh, with some uh, final words about the structure and chapters of the book. Uh, okay. The book uh, tries to develop these uh, fundamental ideas. I, 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 have, I have tried to uh, explain you at least uh, some, um, well, some uh, perspectives uh, in relation to those ideas. Um, and it's the book is structured uh, in the following uh, way. Um, it begins with a foreword by Ismael Peña López, the director of the School of Public Administration of uh, Catalonia, and is accompanied by a chapter of preliminary considerations to the analysis. The chapter has been uh, written by Professor Kassanstein that we have seen uh, in the video. After that, a total of 10 authors in 10 chapters, plus an afterword uh, deals with the issues uh, already explained before and other aspects. Um, I can't give you details, but let me just uh, uh, give you some final ideas about uh, the chapters of the book. The first chapter uh, provides a brief explanation of the history of the insights generated by behavioral sciences, an area in which uh, several Nobel Prizes, as we have seen, have been awarded in recent years. Mm -hmm. um, this first chapter explains about the rationality of human beings, the concept of biases and nudging, and their consequences for law and governance, and uses this first chapter, the COVID-19 pandemic, as a paradigmatic example of an area where nudges and have been used. Uh, for example, in this area, uh, several public authorities in different countries have used uh, nudges referring to vaccines. Those nudges uh, have attempted to overcome the dichotomy between uh, voluntary vaccination versus compulsory vaccination. The nudges have created a, a third way, uh, an intermediate route using nudges, and several academic studies have shown the effectiveness of nudges, such as, and you can see them in the slide, such as reminders, for example, the use of reminders have increased vaccination according to several uh, tests uh, in different countries. Default options, like in the case of uh, uh, donation of organs, for example, in that case, appointments, uh, framing, the use of language, which is a relevant perspective, or the use of social norms, for example. On the other hand, the book uh, includes the, some reflections about digital revolution, uh, taking into account the idea of hypernatches. Hypernatches combine artificial intelligence with big data, and hypernatches in the digital world are extremely powerful, uh, dynamic, and with an uh, enormous impact on people. Mm -hmm. uh, by the way, hypernatches are not always used in the best interest of citizens and consumers. One example is the idea of dark patterns, that is, uh, strategies to manipulate us, 
as consumers or citizens. Um, and I would like to underline that, uh, uh, for example, in Europe, the very recent EU Digital Services Act of 2022 has prohibited dark patterns, uh, which are considered uh, illegal manipulations. After that, there is a second chapter with an economist, Jimenez Gomez, uh, with an explanation about the role of game theory, uh, behavioral economics, and uh, the impact of those concepts in uh, relation to nudging and good governance. Uh, we have a third chapter about uh, considering criticisms of nudging. Okay, they, actually the book considers uh, as many as 16 possible uh, criticisms uh, and includes counter-arguments used by different scholars and uh, developed by different tests. Um, at least there are a couple of um, criticisms which are very common. Uh, one of them is the idea that uh, nudging and nudges and behavioral insight is something that, com that comes from uh, countries like the US or the UK and that other countries um, don't need that kind of concept uh, because in other countries uh, administrative intervention is more accepted. But um, we believe that this is not um, correct. Uh, many people underline that behavioral law, behavioral insights are useful in all kinds of countries because it uh, helps um, regulators to uh, act in a better way. Huh? The idea of manipulation is there too. It's another uh, criticism. Um, but um, again, the book considers other counter-arguments, especially the idea that uh, transparency is uh, necessary and possible, and that um, there is not, actually there is not uh, what is called a libertarian paternalism, but uh, in another expression, I think, clearer, uh, used by Professor Savino Cassese in this field, uh, we're in front of a liberal intervention. And uh, this liberal intervention, using transparency and avoiding opacity, uh, can avoid the risk of manipulation. Anyway, to finish, I would like to make a reference to uh, linguistics. Okay. Beyond uh, economics, we have seen that there is a chapter uh, and several considerations. Linguistics plays an important role in the book and in nudging and uh, in the area of behavioral law. Uh, Professor Montolio Garcia and Polanco, who is with us today, uh, underlined the relevance of linguistics in two different chapters. Mm -hmm. And finally, the last chapter of the book is written by Martin, and the chapter considers how governments face the need to carry out new policies, for example, to achieve the sustainable development goals. Okay. Martin's point is that uh, it's important to institutionalize the evaluation of public policies, and it's important to include external oversight bodies in that process of evaluation. The book concludes, as I told you, with an afterword, an afterword written by uh, Professor Ricardo Rivero, the professor at, at I mean, administrative law and rector, president of the University of Salamanca, and uh, Rivero analyzes the legal state of the art in behavioral insights and uh, advocates for a stronger development, especially in some countries like Catalonia and Spain, which have not developed at all the possibilities of the behavioral toolbox. That's my last slide and my last point. 
I will finish by quoting Professor Ullen, an expert in the area of uh, economic uh, or economy and law. That is law and economics. Professor Ullen considers that um, behavioral law is one of the most important developments, he says, that probably the most important development in legal scholarship in the modern era. Well, it, that's a, a strong uh, statement. I, I think that this development will, will only express, I mean behavioral law, I'm referring to behavioral law, will only express all its potential within a rich conversation with other sciences and uh, those sciences can help um, jurisprudence, legislators, governments and judges to extract practical consequences from how people decide and behave. And I think that it is very relevant for the good government and the good administration. Thank you very much. This is my initial uh, introduction, just uh, giving you some general ideas about the book. But we have the fortune of uh, having with us two other authors. So with your permission and the permission of the director, I will give the floor to Professor Rozas and Professor Polanco. They have uh, collaborated in, in the book. I really appreciate uh, their uh, collaboration. And uh, they can give us more uh, insights and ideas about two different areas, tax law and linguistics, and how they can collaborate too for promoting good government and good administration. So following the order that we have in the program, I'm going to give the floor to Professor uh, Rosas. Uh, welcome and thank you. Thank you very much, Julie, for leading this project and for organizing this presentation. And thank you, Director, for hosting us in the, in the school. Catalan School of Public Law and to all your staff. I, I want to begin by saying that Estrella Montolio, she isn't uh, with us because she had a problem with of agenda, so will be with us, uh, Fernando Polanco. She was the, the, the third soul of, of the project that is in the origins of the, of the book, uh, interdisciplinary project, uh, about this uh, topic with, uh, with uh, Julie, me, myself, and Esther Estrella, we built uh, a, a team, and we have finishing with, with this after five years. Five years, it's, it's amazing. Uh, I disagree with you, Julie, about the tax law is, is not representative in this, in this field. When we began, it wasn't, but uh, three of the chapters of the book are about financial law. The last chapter about spending law and control of the spending uh, activities, the, the chapter by uh, Martin Najera. And the other ones, uh, tax psychology, how behavioral tools can improve the tax system is written by Pablo Grande Serrano. He's a tax officer and now he's working in the general directorate staff and it's very clear that in these years, the, the tax science is working a lot from the behavioral insights point of view. And in fact, in the, in the strategy plan uh, for, for the next four years, there are a specific uh, a reference to uh, behavioral insights. I uh, organized my, um, my presentation First of all, explaining why tax law is a, is a particular uh, field mm, to develop these uh, behavioral tools in, in, in the design and in the manage 
of, of taxes. Why? And, and, and it's clear the reason for me. And then I will organize a little bit the, the presentation explaining some examples of, of these uh, initiatives of tax law, uh, mixing the, the chapter of Pablo Grande and in my chapter that the title was Natchez and Tax Penalties Between Incentive and Deterrence. And then I will finish saying something about the chapter of Martin Najera that it's another, uh, um, another field of, of, the, of the financial law that it's a spending law, but the, the approach is, is just the same, but from another point of view. No, how to obtain better results in tax collation, but how obtain better results in spending activities. So behavioral analysis and public policy evaluation of virtual circle. A tax system is built um, asking to taxpayer a deep cooperation in tax compliance. So you need trust, you need time returns, you need self-assessment. It's a very strange branch of public law because for having success, you need the cooperation of the citizens. And, and, and that's the point because the behavioral tools are particularly interesting for tax administration and, and for tax uh, law. As Julie was uh, explaining, the, 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 the key concept of the behavioral law is the observation of human behavior, the cognitive biases to, to tackle practical problems in in every world of, the, of our life, but in our case, for ma in managing and organizing the public services, in, in organizing, tax collection is a public service, so in, in how to organize, how to design the relationship with the citizens to do it in a more fire and in a more effective uh, way. Paying attention to the predictable reactions of taxpayers in light, in light of what we have learned from behavioral sense, science. So if we know that people had these biases and these heuristics, so we, we have to take profit of these uh, behavioral tools for good governance in tax law and tax administration. That's the point why uh, and, 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 and there are a, 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 a huge uh, literature about uh, t taxation and behavioral, particularly in Anglo-Saxon uh, countries, not in, in, in Spanish literature. But, um, and the OECD that it's, um, is very important in tax policy, they, they have many documents. The last one, Behavioral Insights for Better Tax Administration. The tax administration, they have a deep cooperation in the OECD. There are a, 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 a tax um, group of tax administration working a lot uh, in all over poly tax policies, but particularly also in this one. So let's go to see some examples of how it has worked in, 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 in tax uh, policy. I will organize the, the examples in, in three blocks for preventing the lack of compliance of the tax payment, for preventing, for the, 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 to boost the incentives to, to um, push some uh, behaviors, particular behaviors of the taxpayer, and then the last block, deterring harmful behaviors. So you have to push the, the tax design of the tax, the tax design and the tax manage to a much more easy system to obtain, to prevent the lack of, of the lack of compliance, to prevent the tax evasion, to prevent the tax avoidance, then to incentive some uh, behaviors and then deterrence, deterring harmful behaviors. The first uh, example, and, and, and probably the much more important 
is clear communication. There had been a spin-off of the first project, and now we are working with uh, Estrella, uh, the group of the linguistics and tax scholarships. We are working with the tax agency, uh, uh, with the tax collection department, just in improving the communication of the tax collection department to make much more simple the tax the, 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 the notice of deficiency and the, and the tax pro enforcement procedures. That's very important because how, how do you communicate with people when in, in, in what way the reaction is different, is very different. In these years, for instance, the tax agency, the tax agency in, in, in 2018, they haven't, they haven't a newsletter, a web for, to communicate. They have created a blog, a fiscal blog, <laughs> where the, mm, the chiefs, the, the officers in chief, are writing in a much more simple language, are dis a, a dissemination strategy of the policies in a much more simple language. So that is mm -hmm. a very clear change of the communication policy in the tax agency to improve the legitimate, to, to, to increase the trust of the, of the public not only that's a general uh, 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 communication strategy, but in, a, in particular ways, we're working with them to improve the language of the notice of deficiency, of the, of the communications to the, to, to the taxpayers that they send every day. So, or for instance, it's very useful in, 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 in over, for other tax administration, they use a lot the smartphone. And now the tax administration is beginning to use the, the tax, the, the smartphone, because it's very personal, and you arrive in a much more easier and effective way. The tax collection department has created a, an, an app for paying taxes in a much more simple, or for, for asking for an installment agreement in a much more sim in, in a very, very uh, fast way. And so that's clearly examples of Natchez for organizing the communication to do much more simple the, the, the procedures, the tax procedures. In this, in this, uh, um, in this way, uh, uh, Pablo, uh, in, in, in his chapter, he, is, he, he speaks about sludge. That the idea is first of turning on the air conditioning, you have turning off the heating. So first of thinking about Natchez, you have to solve the obstacles, the administrative burdens that are sometimes are very, very heavy. And, and um, if you design the procedure in a much more simple way, the things will go better. For instance, the, 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 the British tax agency that is leader in this uh, field, they have for many years ago a committee for tax simplification, and they just study all the procedures to transform these procedures in a much more simple way, uh, avoiding the, 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 the burdens that has no, no, no sense. Uh, then another example, the, the idea is, is to design taxes in line with biases of economics audience, to, to increase the, the, the trust in the, in the image of the tax. I will give you a very simple example of this, how to 
change the design of the tax. It, in the Spanish it, in, inheritance tax, there is a coefficient that, so you pay a little much more or, or much more uh, tax if you are wealthy when you receive the inheritance. So you could change the way how you present this increase of the tax. And it's to transform the coefficient in an allowance. You increase the tax rate for everybody, but you set up an allowance for those that are not wealthy when they receive the inheritance. From a mathematic point of view, it's just the same. But the, but the message is very different. Another example that you know, uh, uh, Julie, there are taxes for non-occupied ownership apartments, properties. So another policy would be to increase the general tax rate for all the properties and to set up an allowance for those properties that are occupied, that are busy. So the policy seems the, the same, but the image of the policy is very different from a psychology point of view. So that's how you can weigh with the, the, the impact, the, how the, the, the predictive reaction of tax barriers against a tax policy to, to do it in a much more, mm, mm, I, I, I would say much more mm, receptible for the public, this policy, the message. That's very, very, very uh, clear. And that's because the bias of loss aversion. When you have one thing, it, it, that's the bias. No? So let's go to the second block, that is uh, incentives. Incentives, I propose an example that is very frequent in, 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 in tax uh, law, not in Spain, but for instance, Italy, Greece, uh, Korea, Portugal, is, it, it has been a, 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 a great success with this policy. That is the f a fiscal lottery. The, the, the idea, the objective of these uh, fiscal lotteries is to increase the payments with the, tar with the car credit and to register the operation. It's to fight against the shadow economy. It's very clear that when you are the last consumer in the chain of production, you have not any interest in having the bill or the ticket, because for you, the bill or the ticket is nothing. It's the, 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 the classic, uh, the classic uh, uh, um, uh, question, the classic question, with BAT or without BAT? And if you, know, if you cannot deduct the VAT, you say, without VAT, because for me it's a cost. So to increase the registration of the operations, the public administration organized a lottery. The number of the ticket of the bill is the number that you are playing with in the lottery, so each Three months, they celebrate a lottery, and you win, and you win a, a, a prize. You win a prize, and also the the the, um, the seller participate in this lottery. So it's a nudge to increase the number of operations registered. When you have the operate the operation registered, you have control on the operation, and and the and the and the, and the money will pay the VAT and, 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 and the seller will pay the income tax. So it's clearly an incentive. Or 
uh, uh, Spanish administration is, send, uh, uh, is, is sending information letters. The information letters, they, it's the, the, the bias, they, they were with the bias of anchoring effect or a group reinforcement. The, the classical norm, social norm that do you, you want to be in the line of the other taxpayers. So the tax administration send you a letter saying, listen, uh, you are paying less taxes than people in your sector, in your same city. So it's not the beginning of a tax audit. It's not the beginning of a tax procedure. It's just a message. So for us, it's a little bit strange. Perhaps you have a higher cash flow. Perhaps are you deducting expenses in a not proper way? Just with a letter, you increase the, the tax return, the tax compliance of the taxpayer, because he's, he's, he understand in the comparison with the sector that he's out of the level. So that's clearly a behavioral insight used by the tax administration to increase the, the level of accompliance of, accompliment of the taxes. Or the system certification of, for accounting programs. That's in the way of the lottery and, and so uh, if you use the, the, the system that we are developing, that is developed, for instance, by the Basque Country Administration, Tax Administration in, in Navarra, Ticket Buy, they have developed a, a system of, of a software for filling the billing, and they certificate this, this, this system. If you use this system, you know that a tax audit will be not so frequent because it's very clear that the control is previous. So that's another uh, clearly uh, incentive uh, policy. Determining harmful behaviors. The, ma the, the, the most popular uh, policy in this way is uh, naming and shaming policies. I'm sure that you know that uh, each six months, our tax agency publish the list of the biggest debtors of the tax administration. And, and now there have been a, a, a sentence of the, the Supreme Court that had decided that uh, the debt must be not uh, in discussion in a court. That is a very important change. So, because if you are discussing in the court the debt, you are not property, properly a, 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 a debtor because we, we don't know, we don't uh, uh, yet know which one is the proper uh, level of the, of the tax. But even that, the effect of this policy, it has been impressive, even for the tax agency. Just playing with the reputation and I'm sure that no one read that list, but only to know that you will be in that list change a lot. And, 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 and they have increased a lot the payment of the defaults just with this simple policy, the naming and, and shaming. Or another example is the voluntary disclosure policies. When you have not paid in the right time, you can pay spontaneously, voluntary, later, just with a small fee. So you are, they, they are sending you the, the messages, the message. Listen, as soon as possible, you have, be, you have to pay. Because if, if I arrive with an audit tax procedure, you will pay sanctions and you will pay. That works a lot with 
tax criminal offenders. So if you mm, mm, voluntarily disclose, and we have a, a lot of, of examples of this, or the classical, and in, also in administrative law, you use this to, to mm, uh, pay less mm, penalty when you pay sooner and without controversy. So that's clearly a nudge. Uh, an uh, behavioral policy. So finishing with the last chapter, that is the, the other way of view, the spending uh, policy. That's the chapter of Santiago Martin Najera that he has wrote in a, an excellent thesis, published also by Martial Pons uh, about this topic. And the point of view is that also, the public employees take decisions according with heuristics and biases. So you have to understand that when you evaluate the, the, the public policies to, to have a, a better uh, success. And in fact, it's very clear that in this, in this field of spending uh, policies, evaluation, transparency, accountability are very clear policies that incentive change of behaviors of the public employees. Because if you know that there will be accountability, that there will be transparency, and, and if you organize evaluation policies, is very clear, for instance, in, 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 in spending policies, the activity of the independent, independent authority for fiscal responsibility. They do a lot of analysis about spending policies and about projection, evaluation, the effectiveness of the, of the policies. So it's a very mm, good uh, mm, uh, tool to change behaviors in, in the spending uh, policies to evaluate the effectiveness of the spending policies. So uh, that's the, the three chapters of this uh, topic in, in, in our book. And thank you very much also to the public. And I want to, to, to remember our staff, Leila uh, Adim, that she was our staff and, and Petia, that they have um, helping us in, in, in doing this project and in this in, editing this book. Thank you very much. Well, uh, I want to thank uh, on behalf of, of myself of, and my colleagues, uh, Dr. Julie Ponce and uh, the Escola of Administración uh, the invitation uh, to participate in this uh, event. Well, as the title says, Nudging's Contributions to Good Governance and Good Administration, uh, this book reflects different ways of applying nudge, nudge uh, uh, to, to the good governance and good administration. We as a linguist, uh, are aware that linguistics as such as has been absent uh, as a discipline from behavioral uh, research. So our contribution, contributions in this book uh, try to fill this gap in this sense. The famous, famous acronym EAST, E-A-S-T, proposed by the British government Behavioral Insights Team synthesized four ways of applying uh, behavioral science to design of public policies. E, easy, A, attractive, S, social, and T, timely. Of these, two directly concerned language, language and linguistic action. So, easy and attractive, specifically, the easy principle refers uh, to, the, to the need to propose easy processes and 
uh, simple, clear, and accessible messages. So, as Sustain says, it matters whether an option or message is attractive. A simple and vivid communication has more impact than a dull and complicated one. So, it's very, very clear. And to a large extent, it is also the case of social. For example, using communication strategies related to linguistic courtesy or the construction of identity have a direct impact on the reception uh, of a message. The so-called uh, behavioral linguistics is still uh, prom uh, a promising emerging discipline that can be understood as a brand of linguistics applied uh, to improving uh, public and private uh, institutional communication with a clear reform or reforming ori orientation, that is, with the aim of transforming discourse to towards greater clarity and transparency. We are, as a linguistics, as a linguist, um, sorry, we are convinced that by acting on the form of messages, we can also influence the decision making <coughs> rationality of citizens and their behavior. In this sense, the linguistic action oriented uh, especially to the communication of the administration and public policies becomes a form of nudging that can contribute not only uh, to improve them, but also to respond to the democratic demand for transparency in the communication between administration and citizenship. Indeed, the words, the form of expression, and the context matter. So taking them into account strategically can influence our behavior and the behavior of others, both linguistic and non-linguistic. This is especially relevant with regard to public communication, since it constitutes a modeling instrument of society with the capacity to reinforce, to strengthen, you know, or modify behaviors from benefit of the common good. On the one hand, uh, our contribution in this book uh, tries to reflect the insights of linguistics um, and the com conviction that we can provide scientific rigor on phenomena such as informative and in an interpretative focus in, uh, that impose uh, for example, the older awards. It's uh, uh, Professor Rothans put an example before. No? It's not the same to say, for instance, 80% of people pay their taxes than 20% of people don't pay the taxes because the biases that they are behind and the processes of interpretation that you uh, put uh, uh, that you can, um, uh, I, <laughs> the interpretation behind of this order of words are totally different. In the, in the first case, 80% of people makes you uh, to think about what the most of the people do. So if the most of the people do this, then maybe <clears throat> I must to do that. But if you say 20% of people don't pay, okay, the, mm, the, the percent of people that don't pay, it's little, no? Few people don't pay, so if I don't pay, mm, doesn't matter, okay? So to take, uh, to take this, in a, uh, this uh, strategy in, in account is, uh, it's important, it's relevant. So, uh, to the per perspective, perspectivization of reality uh, linked to the choice of uh, certain uh, kind of, of expressions, especially metaphor uh, ex expressions. Uh, the mental frameworks work uh, evoked by words or expressions. If you say uh, that something is like a cancer, then you, uh, you are promoting the action in one way. If you say that something is a problem, 
then your action uh, it's very, can, can be very different. Uh, the mental frameworks are work, uh, uh, evoked by words, so are very, very relevant too. And the importance of the mechanisms of communicative uh, in direction. It's not the same to, uh, to say someone uh, sit down than please sit down if you want. Have, has a different impact in the making decision of this Decision, uh, the decision that this, the, this, this person can, can have. And uh, to linguistic politeness to call the action of the receiver or the construction of identity uh, through language, for instance, among many other aspects that intervene in communication. And in the other hand, uh, from, a, from an applied perspective, uh, providing clear com uh, communication resources to the institutional discourse in its different variants and formats increases, increases its effectiveness. Making its emissions simple, clear, easy, and attractive, accessible, persuasive can help institutional communication to better fulfill its mission with a greater social impact. In Proving the quality of information that the citizen receives <clears throat> reinforces their right to understand the administrations and guarantees their legal certainty, for instance. So, likewise, transparency and good govern governance are reinforced, and consequently, the truth, uh, the, the trust of citizens in them, too. In short, the Clarification of public discourse is in itself an important nudge that contributes to making the, li the lives of citizens simpler, safer, or easier. Thank you. Think that uh, we have we have been giving we have uh, given a general idea of the book. Uh, perhaps we can use a couple of minutes more to to discuss some aspects just between us or with the public, obviously. Um, if if. Uh, with your permission, I, I will begin by introducing a question uh, in relation to the book, but in relation to public policy and, improve, and the improvement of public policies and uh, good government and good governance, etc. The question is that um, Professor Rothas told us that uh, there, has been, there has been a change in the field of tax law in the sense that uh, since 2018, when we began our works, uh, he believes that uh, at least we are talking about, we are talking about Spain specifically, and in Spain we are talking about the state level. Is that right? Okay. So if I'm not wrong, you have said that you have uh, uh, realized that there is a change Okay, um, but I think that, that and the, the afterword written by Professor Ricardo Rivero in that sense is very clear. I think that some countries um, are not using uh, those uh, scientific uh, insights. Uh, and in my opinion, uh, Spain and others are good examples of that. Beyond that, in some areas, perhaps tax law, perhaps the state level, uh, there are some steps in the direction of using science and uh, knowledge to improve public policies. Mike, it's not a question, it's just a conversation with the authors and with the director of the uh, uh, school and with people uh, who are here today. My question is uh, why, 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 why do you think we are not using 
uh, that knowledge? Why do you think that we are not innovating in some areas when we have uh, clear information about uh, experiments, tests? We have a, a huge amount of information about uh, some nudges, and we know that they work, and they work pretty well, and they are inexpensive. So this is, the, this is my question. Uh, it's a general question, a rhetorical question. Why some countries uh, are not using knowledge to improve public policies if the knowledge is available and if uh, we have information about the effectiveness of that kind of mechanisms? I think, uh, Julie, that probably because lack of knowledge, uh, at least I had begun to, to read about that just with you and, and, and um, with some, um, I remember a, a tax inspector, uh, he, he was that I'm supervising his thesis and he was the first person that was speaking to me about that. Uh, so the, the first point is lack of, uh, of knowledge, but at now is better knowledge that there has been, we have, we are offering this book, and we, and at least at now, I think that the topic is, is in the agenda, is in the air. Perhaps in the tax administration, the region of this is the OECD, because the tax administration, uh, they work a lot in a cooperation way. From 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 many time ago, but particularly in the last uh, years with the G20 and, and, the, and the projects of the Pillar 1, Pillar 2, and, and, and the tax forces, and the, the change of information between the tax administrations is extremely, extremely deep. Uh, and so they cooperate a lot between them. The knowledge of the comparative law perhaps is higher in the tax administration that in other administration. It could be that the, the and, and also because of personal uh, situation, the last, the, 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 um, the former general director of the tax agency and that he's now the secretary of the treasury, Jesus Gascon, he, he is very, he knows very well these, these uh, tools. And so he called to Pablo Grande, to his team. So perhaps that's because in the tax administration, uh, there is a sensibility, a, responsive, a responsiveness between through this, these, the behavioral science. And also I think, because the the the, the um, in in an, in other administration forces there are more inertia, and, and we have done that every time. So why must we change? But the tax agency <coughs> need the cooperation of the taxpayers, so they have understand that um, this is a way to do the to do the policies in a cheaper way in a more effective and fair way. Can I? Please. You are at home. I, I'm you sorry, I have a, a much stronger opinion, a negative one about this. I mean, I agree with you, but going on, a, on another level, I think that one of the big problems that we have today in public management is that there is no interest in public management in general. And in particular, uh, one of the definitions of, of the difference between uh, outcome and output or impact and result is precisely the change of behavior. So I, and I don't think that in general, uh, in public management, we're in much interested in, in changing behavior. We are more interested in results. Uh, we want to not to reduce poverty, but we want to have many people having these shares for free lunch and etc. In the case of the tax agency, it might be the same thing, not exactly, but I think that we, we lack this aim towards changing the behavior of people and we only look at results or outputs. That would be for me one of, of the main reasons that we don't, we're not interested precisely in nudging and behavioral sciences because 
public administration in general is not interested in changing behaviors on having social impact and only having results. Uh, my procedure, did I finish it? Yes, with or without an impact, doesn't matter. Related to this, and I'm sorry for the negative approach, but this is actually what the School of, of Public Administration wants to head forward in, in the next years, is that at the political level, uh, there's lack of strategy in general. So if you want to have an impact, if you want to have outcomes, if you want to change behavior, you, don't, you have to have a plan. If you don't have a plan, you don't care about a science that is helping you to having an impact and leading towards the goals of your plan. If there's no plan, there's no goals, you don't need that kind of science. I'm trying to simplify things. I know that things are much more complex and there are many people committed with impact, but I think that in general we lack this commitment with public administration and the commitment to, 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 Im to change the system, not only to act within a given system, but to change the system. But probably there, there, is, a, there is a confusion between uh, uh, changing behavior and results. Let's take the case that uh, Professor Sunstein has used uh, in his intervention about free meals for poor people. We want results. We want that poor people at schools, poor children, get free meals. In order to do that, we need to change behavior. That example of the, the default option, you are in the program except you say otherwise. So it's curious that distinction between having results and changing behavior as considering two different things. No? Uh, in my view, I, I would like to introduce another uh, input in the discussion, I don't know, but my impression has to do with the idea that I have introduced of uh, proportionality, the idea of considering alternatives, the idea of uh, measuring. In my opinion, in some countries, uh, um, Probably, I'm not going to be very um, accurate, but uh, in some countries which are heirs of the uh, French tradition of the trois administratif, uh, let's say in that way, uh, the elite and the people leading public administration, because we are talking not just about public administration, not just about public employees, we are talking especially about elected officials and senior officials who must plan and decide strategies, etc. I think that in those countries, I don't know if, if you agree, uh, there is uh, inertia, and on the other hand, almost a mythological belief in the power of rules. That is, some elected officials, some senior officials think that if they have a problem, they will enact a rule. The rule will be published in the official bulletin and the problem will be solved because command and control is our tradition so command and control, prohibition, limitation, and sanction, and it will work. Uh, but it, it doesn't work in many, in many areas, and we know that because we have experiments uh, uh, and we have a huge literature that we collect in our book that in some cases it doesn't work. So uh, again, my question is why uh, we are, we in general, why some public uh, officials are insisting in some public policies without results, when we now uh, know, thanks to that knowledge, that it's possible to use other, uh, I mean, other alternative, other routes, uh, which are effective. I dare to introduce the idea of uh, tradition, inertia, that's the way in which we do things. Uh, and if we pass a regulation, it will solve the problem, just prohibiting or limitation. I think that COVID-19 has been a good, a good uh, I mean, uh, it has been a disaster, but uh, from the perspective of, uh, of uh, thinking about those issues, 
it has been an interesting period because, for example, in some countries, like in Spain, masks have been uh, compulsory. But it's impossible that uh, uh, police uh, control a million people wearing or not masks. So it has to do with trusting people, giving some instructions, nudging them, explaining, framing messages. So I think that, uh, I don't know, but I think that in some countries the ways of developing public policies are quite old and quite uh, out of date. I don't know if that's the word, but it's just uh, an hypothesis. And really, that's because the, the chapter of Santiago is so important because the, the, uh, the approach of Santiago is uh, that the evaluation of the spending public policies, the accountability, is a very strong tool for changing the mentality of the tax officer, of the officers, the public, the civil servants, mm, uh, focusing focusing on results and not on the legal procedure of spending the money. It's not the way have you have to respect, the, it's important to respect the, the, the administrative rules for spending the money, but it's much more important the effectiveness of your policy. And even though and you, can have, you, you can success in your policy without the spending, in a much more simple way with the tools of the social behavioral sciences. So that's, mm, mm, that's important to, for changing the, the, this mentality. Okay, I think that uh, uh, we don't want to punish uh, audience too much, but um, if there is any question or any comment, sure. Hi, hello, I'm Raquel Tarriga and I work for the Spanish National Commission for Markets and Competition. Uh, thank you very much for the presentation, it's been very interesting. And uh, I also agree with the speakers that, uh, indeed, public administrations could use in a more extensive way uh, the, the notion and, and the concept of not just and using and incorporating them in the public policies and regulations. But my question is about the private sector. I think, as Professor Ponce said, the Natchez are used by the private, private uh, sector, private companies as well sometimes not in the best way, meaning that they are not necessarily benefiting, benefiting um, consumers and citizens. So as um, public administrations, what should we do about it? Can we supervise it? Can we monitor, detect, punish um, the, this um, use, bad use of matches? Is it possible to do so? What are you, your thoughts about it? <coughs> Do I, do I proceed? Yeah. yeah. Thank you for the question. <coughs> um, yeah, the, the, in the book we consider both the, the public sector and the private sector, although our emphasis is on public, public sector in, in two different ways. We can say that um, the book considers the public sector from an internal perspective, how public managers uh, decide and the need of knowing, because it's, it's important, and I think that uh, public schools should promote knowledge and training in the sense that everybody has biases, including the president of the government in the country that you can choose. So public decision makers, they are human and they have biases, which is another there is another interesting discussion, not in that book, in the future, about the use of um, artificial intelligence and algorithmic systems and uh, automated decisions and how it can help or not 
to avoid bi human biases. I can say that, in my opinion, those those or this kind of technology is introducing other biases coming from the uh, human who program algorithmic systems and biases coming from data. But th this is another another area. Although we talk about hyper natures, but also. so the first perspective is public sector internal. The second perspective is public sector external. How public sector can develop better regulations in the sense of inter public interventions, including uh, rulemaking and other techniques, uh, to, to have a more effective uh, intervention by knowing citizens' biases and knowing how they will react in front of uh, an intervention. Um, but we, we consider too uh, the use by uh, the use of uh, nudges by private sector. And you are right. I mean, um, our concern in the book is uh, primarily uh, improving uh, activity in public sector. But as you know, and uh, we know, uh, private te sector has been using Natchez for a long, long time, both in the real world, and supermarkets are a good, a good example of choice architecture, and I mean designing the products and attracting consumers, etc., uh, both in the real world and in the digital world. That's, I think, that probably the um, most um, um, dangerous use of Natchez is the use of digital Natchez in the digital uh, world um, by private companies. I have, men I have mentioned the, the concept of dark patterns that I'm sure that you know perfectly. That is, a list of uh, manipulations that private companies use on internet uh, using uh, interfaces uh, and introducing nudges to oblige, uh, to manipulate uh, consumers in order to buy more uh, online. This is not an easy topic. Uh, there are, even in the field of protection of uh, competition, as far as I know, the British authority has been interested in, uh, in digital nudges and dark patterns, for example. Uh, but it goes beyond uh, competition. It affects manipulation. It, ha it affects uh, rights, some of uh, the constitutional rights of, of the people. So in, in Europe, and I'm finishing in Euro, has been a, a discussion about the possibility of regulating that kind of uh, bad nudges used by the private sector. And if uh, it could be a good idea to have a specific regulation or if regulation in the field of uh, data protection and the protection of consumers could be uh, enough. You know? Finally, in, in Europe, the decision has been to enact a specific uh, regulation, which is included, I, I have mentioned it briefly, in the EU Digital Services Act, which has been passed uh, some months ago, and introduces Article 25 saying that some practices, practices are prohibited. And the EU Digital Services Act is clearly mentioning uh, uh, dark patterns, but not just. It, it goes beyond my knowledge if uh, it, in, in, the, in, the, in practical terms, if it's, it's possible to detect, and it's possible to react, and it's possible to supervise, and it's possible to find uh, that kind of natches. But at least from a general point of view, the discussion between specific or not a specific regulation has been solved in favor of a specific regulation. In that sense, if I'm not wrong, 
we are following the path of some American regulations. Uh, for example, as far as I know, in California, a couple of years ago, they prohibited duck patterns too. Uh, and now in the European Union, we have followed the same, the same, uh, I mean, the same path. No, it's it's a it's a hot topic. I think it's a, it's an important topic, uh, and the power of manipulating people through the use of natchez in the digital environment. I think it's it's something. Um, I mean. Uh, something important, and we have to be bo bo worried about that. Um, that's my impression. I don't know if you have more information about that, or if you want to add something. Yes, I think that the, the answer to the question is in the question itself. I think that we should, the, the public sector should be behaving in a certain way in order to create a culture. I think that, for instance, in data protection policies, it's pretty clear that we have three models. The Eastern model, if you want the Chinese, the Russian model, which is a model. The other one is the American model, and the European model is quite different. And beyond regulation, which is, of course, different. I think that in Europe, we succeeded to have a culture about protection of data. And so that some debates around, for instance, collecting or gathering data in schools through e-learning platforms or through apps in our mobile phones is heated and it's socialized way beyond what regulation says. And that has been because the public administrations in general and the European Commission in particular have fostered a specific culture uh, by behaving in a specific way. So uh, in addition to regulation, I think that uh, what public administrations should be doing is, again, in addition to regulating, is just behaving and being one step ahead. And here I agree with Professor Rothas that if we were like more propositive in using this kind of technologies, in using them um, intensively, we should be uh, fostering a specific kind of culture that then uh, helped or, or, yeah, or supported by a specific uh, regulation context should be helping that not the state by people would and just forbid some kind of practices by the private sector. Yes, in fact, that is also a, a tool. So you can use a tool as in a good way or in a bad way. The, the private sector is very clear that from many years ago, they know very well the behavioral sciences. And they use a lot in the marketing, in the advertisement, in, in whatever. It, but in fact, the public sector is much more in, 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 in retard with, uh, with these uh, techniques. I will give you just a very simple example. The, the, his linguistic team, they have, they have worked with Kesa Bank or with natural gas company to simplify the contracts. So they have understand first and why? Because the, the, the pressure of the accountability uh, in front of the stakeholders of a company is very hard. They have to offer results and they have to resolve problems. But this accountability is lesser in the public sector. So, but at least that now the tax collection department in the tax Spanish agency is interesting in changing the framing of the notices of the communications. So that's a, a good uh, news, good news. So it's, it's not fast, but step by step, they are uh, learning that what the private sector knew from many years ago. Okay, director, you are the boss, but I think... So, any other question? Just uh, one, one uh, short uh, question. First of all, to congratulate the members that of the, this presentation of, uh, of the, that amazing, that, that very fine, good uh, book. 
I, I would uh, add on uh, reference, considering the, the last uh, question regarding the competence in the private law, uh, regarding all of what we have discussed right now, because um, I was uh, carefully listening to uh, the, the intervention of uh, Professor Sandstein, and I, I noticed that uh, more explicit or implicitly, underneath his intervention, he point out that the, the, the very fact of the role, uh, I guess, the role of uh, public administration as uh, a guarantee, a warranty uh, in order to uh, make real, the, make uh, people be able uh, of choosing, uh, to, to warrant the freedom, the freedom of choosing, the freedom of, um, of uh, um, doing, uh, doing any kind of uh, uh, public uh, um, things or, uh, or within the contracts, uh, in the contract law, for example, uh, having with us uh, law students, uh, I would say that uh, if we take a look on the contract law elements um, the, that we all have studied in, in uh, private law, we we know we know everybody knows that uh, the contract law makes is made by the the, the offer and acceptance, but neither the the offer or the acceptance is supported or is backed by the government by the law. If there is another ingredient, if there is no uh, freedom, freedom uh, to to make this country, to make the offer, if, uh, in freedom, and what is uh, underneath freedom is the the knowledge, the what the the elements that make us free to make a contract. So I think if. As far as freedom uh, is uh, an essential uh, concept within within the private private law, and uh, matching with the remarks of Professor Sandstein, being an American prof law professor, I think um, it's very important that the message he uh, he put on the table uh, of. Um, of the role of administration guaranteeing the the role of freedom within within the the citizenship everywhere because as uh, uh, it was said uh, many years ago uh, freedom always have many dangers so freedom needs production thank you very much i i th i think it's an interesting comment but Go, go. No, I, I, I only give you an example that is, I think that is very clear in this sense. And, and for instance, it's clear that the freedom is important, but the, the point is, if you are conscious of, 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 the, of, the, of the choose, and, and the point is to nudge you to a good choice for you and for me. And for instance, I give you a, a, an example in, 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 in tax management of the payments. Uh, the compliance by by design, they they they, they call this this procedure the compliance compliance by design, is grounded on the in, in, on the default on the default. So, the first time you are paying the tax through a bank, the default choose is that the next tax period you will pay by debit in the bank. So that's much, that's better for you and for me because you will have less work and you will pay a time. So that's the compliance by design. Are you free to check the point but, or to uncheck, but by default, is checking. So that's the way that you respect the freedom to uncheck, but by default, you check. 
that's that's the way with the organs so i but i think that it, it's just a notch perhaps something more than a notch but a notch but respecting the freedom yeah, I, I think that you know, the common is interesting in the sense that uh, in the sense that uh, yes, the idea of Natch uh, the, is uh, respecting personal freedom, but it it can be confusing. Um, let let me say something about that. Obviously, in a democratic state, uh, personal freedom uh, is something important, but the protection of general interest must uh, need uh, some prohibitions and limitations. That's clear. Uh, that's clear. One of the 16 criticisms that we consider in the book is precisely that uh, the idea of behavioral insights and nudging tries to replace replace to um, uh, to be an alternative instead of prohibiting or limiting and fining uh, people violating the, the limits in our opinion in my opinion I, I wrote this chapter uh, this is a mistake the idea of behavioral insights and the nudges as a develop, one of the developments of the behavioral insights uh, is not something for replacing limits and prohibitions, but to complement them. It's clear that in some areas, uh, prohibitions and limitations and fines uh, will be important and will be there and will be relevant. But in some other areas, this knowledge uh, gives us another alternative. This is why I, I consider the idea of proportionality. Because uh, in, the same, in the same way that some people cannot understand that in order to achieving results, uh, free meals for poor people at the schools, you need to change a behavior which is not applying for uh, this, uh, this possibility because you don't have the knowledge, the time, you're poor, etc. If you change the behavior, you will have a result. The same in, in the donation of organs. No? Uh, in the same way that some people don't understand this, I think that some people don't understand that there is an alternative to prohibit, limit, and fine, command and control, and this alternative is less intrusive, less aggressive for the rights of people. And this alternative is based on behavioral insights. So what uh, public decision makers uh, should take into account, and I think that in some countries we are uh, far away from that, because our legal political and administrative tradition, which has to do with authoritarianism. I have talked about a tradition of authoritarianism and the idea that if I limit and prohibit and fine, it will work pretty well and I don't have to look for another alternative. But the principle of proportionality is saying us that uh, it's necessary to consider different alternative, at least one in each intervention. And uh, we have to choose the less burdensome, the less aggressive uh, alternative for the personal freedom and for the rights of the people if the less aggressive alternative allow, uh, allows the public uh, decision maker to get the, the general interest. So I think that uh, this is an important point and we should think twice. And I think that uh, in some countries this is not the way that our, uh, that our public decision makers think about public intervention. They think about uh, command and control. This is our tradition. And there is no other alternative. Yes, we have now other alternatives. We have other alternatives which can be effective so it means, it means that 
uh, to say it in a, in a plain English, uh, following uh, the recommendations of uh, our friends, uh, in the future, it's not impossible to think about a public decision which will be declared void and null because will break the principle of proportionality because uh, the decision has used a prohibition uh, and a limitation instead of using other measures less aggressive uh, that uh, can be proved effective too. And it can, it, that case, in the future, I don't, I don't, as far as I know, there, are, there is no similar cases, at least in, in Spain and in, in the countries of which I know. But that's, this is not uh, something uh, impossible that uh, a citizen uh, claims against an administration saying, look, they have prohibited and limited my behavior when there is another alternative less aggressive, and uh, it's possible to use that, and I can prove that it's uh, so effective as the other alternative. So yes, my, the answer is yes, freedom is important here, but not because Natchez want to replace limitation and prohibition. Limitation and prohibition when uh, negative externalities are important and there are no uh, effective alternatives, must be there, obviously, this is clear. But the range of options are, or is now wider and more interesting because we have new tools and tools which has passed tests in labs and in the real life in some countries saying that they are effective uh, promoting vaccination, uh, collecting taxes, uh, avoiding uh, waste, uh, I mean, so there's something that a public manager should take into account because it's good, but because the legal system is saying something about freedom and proportionality too. Okay. I'm not going to open now another box or take sides, but I think that once you get the genie out of the bottle saying that we are not rational, that we are not the home economicus. Talking about freedom is sort of weird. I mean, maybe it's more honest or more coherent saying what degrees of awareness do you have instead of what degrees of freedom do you have? I don't want to be deterministic here. Maybe yes, I'm not taking sides. Just saying that once you get the, you open the Pantora box and you get the genie out of the bottle saying we are not rational, maybe freedom is not the question. Maybe it's what degree of awareness do we want to have? Yeah, we are not perfectly rational. Mm -hmm. okay. We commit <laughs> systematic errors, which doesn't mean that we are irrational. <coughs> Sorry, which doesn't mean that we are irrational. <laughs> if we say that we are completely rational, this is another scenario. I'd say I was not taking sides, <laughs> just stating that someone took the genie out of the bottle. If I may, uh, let's be aware that we have to make dinner for our children, <laughs> some of your grandchildren maybe, and that we've been here like two hours and a half instead of one hour, which is, I think, good news. We had a very good debate. And if there are no more questions or one last question, I would just call the session off. And, of course, we can gather again here to speak about freedom and awareness and whether, uh, what degree we are rational or not, and law makes some sense or not. Yeah, thank you. Thank okay. you very much, thank you very much everyone.